What is a spirit? There um, are lots of different people who might answer this question a lot of different ways, take a lot of different approaches to try and answer it. We are going to restrict uh, our source to the Bible because the devil is a liar and there's lots of so-called information out there in all different kinds of books and um, traditions, if you want to call them that, but they they don't lead the truth. Um, God is the only sure truth, and so therefore we rely upon what he has revealed about himself in order to gain understanding about these things. And how helpful is it that God has given a, a book, a revelation about the realm of the soul and the realm of the spirit, these intangible things which uh, are inscrutable by the scientific method. Um, the first thing that we need to understand about spirit is that there is a very, very close connection between soul and spirit, though they are not the same thing, and that Point, that thing that I just said, that soul and spirit are not the same thing, is not without controversy. And there are definitely people who disagree with me on that. And so, um, just because I'm some person on the internet making a truth claim, well, we have to use discernment. And I'm going to make a truth claim, but then you have to judge a tree by its fruit. Judge it by its explanatory power. Judge it by its... Um, satisfactory explanatory power that I'm not putting on my tap shoes and jumping through flaming hoops of fire, but I'm just comfortably giving an explanation and it really seems to, to satisfy uh, or not. Um, consider the alternate arguments and ultimately you have to decide for yourself whether it is true or not. I, after um, praying about this for years because it's just... Uh, well, let's just read it. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Um, this verse says to me that the fact that you have to have a, a precision instrument, which is the word of God, in order to divide soul and spirit, they're, they're like bound together. And they normally stick together very tightly. And so if you think about, say, like the nucleus of an atom, where you have protons and neutrons, those are bound together, and it takes a very great amount of specialized skill in order to be able to separate them. But just because it's hard doesn't mean that it, excuse me, doesn't mean that it's not possible. Um, and we're given the tool, and the tool is the Word of God, and uh, hopefully a knowledge of the full revelation of the Word of God. Uh, there are some people, so Descartes, Rene Descartes was kind of famous, right? He said, um, I think, therefore, I am. And so his uh, brand of philosophy, which has substantially influenced Christian thought, would be called something along the lines of mind-body dualism. And so the claim is, okay, my mind, my soul, my spirit, my heart, my intangible part of my life, but then there's also that stuff, body, and so the, the, man is broken up into two distinctly different elements. But is, is that true? And my interpretation of Scripture says, no, it's not true. Uh, Isaiah 42, chapter 42, verse 1, Behold my servant, so the Lord God is speaking here. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. I think pretty obviously uh, this prophecy is about the coming Messiah. And so 
God says, in whom I, my soul delighteth and have put my spirit upon him. And so if we're going to make the claim that soul and spirit are the same thing, somebody could argue in this verse that, that God is just kind of, uh, he's using some kind of uh, literary method. He, he's wanting to say the same thing, but he doesn't want to use the same word. And so he's saying, you know, I mean, if they're synonymous, in whom my elect in whom my spirit delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. What's interesting to me about this is that it's never one time said. I mean, if we're making the claim that these phrases, these words are interchangeable, they're synonymous. It's never one time said that a soul of a, of a spirit comes upon a person. The soul of the living God came upon him and he prophesied. It doesn't exist. Right. And so it's just it's just kind of a curious little thing. Like if soul and spirit are in fact the same thing, then why couldn't you say the soul of the living God came upon him and he prophesied? I mean, that's just I mean, first of all, it sounds weird, but the Bible never, never says that. And as a matter of fact, in um, First Thessalonians five at the end, Paul is um giving kind of a benediction and he says, may your whole body and soul and spirit remain blameless. And so what kind of an odd thing, of course, you also will remember whenever Jesus is um, giving the famous love command saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And it seems like that commenters have, have real difficulty with this for some reason. It's clear to me that for example, whenever Paul says, may your whole body and soul and spirit be uh, blameless, he's just saying something very plain and very clear. And just because the majority of talk of the, the human frame, the body and whatever the inner man is, is only talking about... Um, body and soul or body and spirit or mind. Sometimes you're talking about multiple parts of the inner man, heart and mind, heart and soul, things like that. Um, when, whenever I have these, or we have these different authors that are using these different terms repeatedly, I, I'm just not buying that they're the same thing. And especially like um, the, the, the example that I'm using with respect to Paul in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, may your, may your whole body and soul and soul remain blameless. Now, it, you're making a distinction between two different things, but yet you're trying to emphasize one of those things. Would you ever find yourself saying body and soul, and soul, just to throw it in there another time. I'm not saying that people never use a literary device of repetition, but I've literally never heard of that device of repetition where you take two seemingly very different things and you repeat one of them twice, but not the other one. It's confusing. I think it's confusing. And so I just, I, I just don't buy it, okay? I don't buy it at all. And so my whole point in talking about this is to recognize that the soul and the spirit are not the same. They are very tightly bound. But the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, is able to help us disentangle them as a precision instrument. And so I feel like that the Lord has given me two different parables, as it were, of trying to understand the difference between soul and spirit. And so the first one I'm going to read, um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and then I'm going to give the parable. Uh, and the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. Okay, first of all, the term breath of life, the word spirit, ruach, well, this, this actually is not Ruach, it's a different word, but it is actually translated two different times, spirit, in the Old Testament, and in Hebrew. And it, it can obviously mean 
spirit since the in that context given the fact that they translated it that way right um and man became a living soul and so the breath of life which is also synonymous with the word spirit and the the spirit out of god's mouth breathed into him the man adam and adam became a living soul and so we see that soul comes from spirit it's animated by spirit, but yet at the same time, it's not independent of spirit. It's not like it's created and all of a sudden it's just independent. It depends upon spirit too. And so we see the constitution right here of the inner man. And this is the, tr- this is the trinity of man right here in this passage. Dust to the ground, body, breath of life, spirit, living soul, soul, body, soul, spirit, right? We see the, tr- we see the, trinity of man and what does that mean made in the image of god who is also triune father son holy spirit okay so man is made in the image of god and so we see that we see god's breath in his mouth his spirit he breathes and it creates he creates this thing that didn't exist before and also animates this dust that seems to become a living person very interesting okay and so the the Um, the parable here is stock and flow. And you may not be familiar. I actually learned these terms in an economics class of all places. But a flow is like, think of a stock and a flow as you're filling up a pitcher of water. You turn on the faucet, the water's running. It obviously is not the same. The water that's running in any moment is obviously not the same volume as your whole pitcher or else it'd be instantly filled up, right? You stick the pitcher under the water, the flow is fairly constant, and eventually it goes on long enough that it fills up the pitcher, okay? And then all the water's contained in the pitcher. And so the flow is the water coming out of the faucet, the stock is the pitcher of water. In the same way, the flow is the spirit that is the source of life, that is the breath of life, and the stock is the soul, which accumulates over time. And via interactions with the spirit, gifts of the spirit, experiences that God gives us, it becomes this stock that becomes more complicated, more intricate, um, hopefully with the... uh, restoration of the soul that God promises in Psalm 23, it becomes more pure, more alive, more beautiful, more honoring to God over time. So there's there's one parable. The second one is the, um, well, let me read this verse from Lamentations, uh, chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. And so the the author is lamenting, right? He's remembering affliction and gall and misery. Uh, My soul hath them in remembrance. So this is knowledge. This is a bit of information. This I recall to my mind. And so his mind brings it into understanding it's recalling this information from the soul and then it operates on this information just like a computer would right and so think about the way that a computer works you have a a processor and the processor is able to take information from a storage device whether it's a hard drive or flash drive or some such thing where information is stored the processor accesses that information that is stored and then transforms it, analyzes it, and perhaps uses outside information and it analyzes the information that it has. And it also uses the information from the hard drive to give it a kind of an algorithm, a kind of pattern of how to analyze the given information, okay? I don't know if that if that explanation is any good or not. I hope that it makes sense to you. But the soul 
is a is a store of memories and experiences and in, of information, a type of information. It is alive, and so it's not like it's like a a brick or something. It is a living container of of information and experiences. The spirit can access the soul and it can get information based on so your worldview, the way that you look at the world, the way that you explain and understand and predict uh, events and circumstances that happen around you. The mind is the rational machine that is able to analyze the information around you and understand it. Right, and so the 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 soul doesn't necessarily. It's possible, maybe, that the soul understands something, but the way that it seems to me that the Bible talks about the soul is that it knows, and it also has an, has uh, emotion, but the soul knows something, but the understanding comes in with respect to the spirit, and so it's important to understand that a spirit of man is his mind, okay? And so the spirit of man is more than his mind because as we saw, for example, in the Genesis 2 passages, the spirit is the spark of life. You can put all the um, the components, the recipe of a cell, all the chemicals into a test tube. You can actually take a cell, a living cell, poke it so that all, all the chemicals are still in the test tube, but you can't put the thing back together again. The spark of life is the spirit, Right? And so spirit is not just a man's mind, but part of what the human spirit is, is a man's mind to help him to have transcendence over the physical processes and uh, matter of the world and be able to understand it, to be able to have a, a basis. And ultimately that basis is in the spirit of God. He existed outside of space, time and matter and therefore was able to begin the universe um, space, time, and matter didn't exist, and therefore it couldn't create itself, right? Something outside of space, time, and matter had to exist in order to start it into motion and start it into being. In the same way, the the spirit of man is able to transcend space, time, and matter and give him a basis for rightly perceiving and understanding that space, time, and matter, which again ultimately is derived out of the whole, the Holy Spirit of God who exists outside of space, time, and matter. Job chapter 20, verse 3, and this is in the, um, I'm what I'm looking on is page 8. It might be around page 8 if you're looking at the, the book, which is, again, linked in the description. Um, mind is spirit is what the section is. Job chapter 20, verse 3, I have heard the check of my reproach, and the spirit of my understandeth causeth me Excuse me. The spirit of my understanding causeth me to answer. Let's read uh, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. And belly can be translated heart. Okay. Uh, Romans eight twenty seven. This is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And then um, two more verses. Ephesians 4.23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, because your mind is a spirit. That's why he said it. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so this, the, the way you know, naturalists will say, well, a man's mind is his brain. And so the atoms are going boing, 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 and some, somehow that ends up in mind being able to be self-aware and be able to perceive and understand and be rational and so on and so forth, right? Well, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Um, 
a man is rational and has understanding because God breathed a spirit into him, which gives him a basis for the understanding, okay? And then a man's soul is, in a sense, a fruit of that labor. And so man has understanding, man has whatever whatever it is that the work of the Spirit is doing in a person's life, and that culminates, and the fruit of the thing is the soul of a man, and those two things are bound very tightly together, and it, it takes a precision instrument to be able to separate those things. So now this video has gone on way longer than I wanted it to, and I still have more to say, and so this is going to have to be part one of the question, what is a spirit? And we will continue part two in the next video.